The battleships of Pearl Harbor are an interesting subject. They range from the instantly recognizable to the almost forgotten. You have your Arizonas and West Virginias. And then you have your Utahs. It's not a surprising thing when you think about how much the big names dominate discussion. However, you also have the middle ground. Ships that are still remembered well enough, but are nowhere near as famous as the big names. USS California is a prime example of these ships. Her name recognition may not be the greatest, but she still gave good service after her repairs were complete. I also admit to, personally, finding her the best looking of these standard rebuilds. That aside, let's look at the basic technical details, and then her service history, as always. As the second of the Tennessee-class battleships, California was one of the last of the standard type. The only ones to come after her were the three completed Colorados, which were quite a jump in capability. You could look at California as the end of an era in that regard. Then again, the Colorados were basically the Tennessee design, but with bigger guns and slight armor tweaks. California, meanwhile, was as standard as they came. Pun very much intended. Displacing chest shy of 33,000 tons at her normal load, and 33,723 tons at her full load, California was only very slightly heavier than the older New Mexico design. On that tonnage, California continued to retain the 14-inch gun, despite long-running attempts to jump to a 16-inch weapon. That it was something the Navy desired is reflected in Colorado, which, as said before, was a Tennessee with 16-inch guns at her most basic. For the moment, however, California would continue the American tradition of 14-inch rifles stretching back to USS New York. Her model of gun was, at least, a more capable 14-inch 50 caliber weapon shared with the preceding New Mexico class. Also shared with New Mexico, and Pennsylvania for that matter, was the number of barrels. California carried 12 14-inch, 356mm guns in four triple turrets. Or, more accurately, four three-gun turrets, because the barrels could elevate independently. Regardless, this large number of guns was for a simple reason. The American Navy really, really liked weight of fire. The more big guns, the better. You see this crop up with the 1920s South Dakota design that carried 12 16-inch guns. And for that matter, the same goes for the Montana design, although that's much later on. More shells equated to more chances to hit the target, as well as a heavier broadside weight of fire. In any event, those 12 guns were supported by an equally heavy secondary battery. No fewer than 14 5-inch 51 caliber guns in this case. 10 were mounted in the superstructure in traditional casement mountings. These were above the main deck level, which did make them more habitable than similar mountings in the hull at least to some extent. The remaining four guns, on the other hand, were another deck higher in open mounts, two on either side of the conning tower, and the other two on either side of the funnels. To back these up, California carried four three-inch anti-aircraft guns on the same level as the open secondary guns, enough to annoy any air attack, but then again in 1916, very few air attacks were any real threat anyway. Now to round things off, you have the obligatory two submerged torpedo tubes. 21 inch torpedoes in this case, with one tube on either broadside. As for the armor protection, that was functionally the same as it had been since USS Nevada. A main belt of 13.5 inches, or 343 millimeters, at its thickest. This was in the classic all-or-nothing layout, with only the most important parts of the ship 
receiving the thick protection. This concentrated the weight and allowed for thicker armor protection on the Citadel. While, in theory, the ship could remain afloat on reserve buoyancy in the aforementioned Citadel, no matter how much of the rest of the ship got shot up and flooded. And now, to wrap up the technical details. California maintained the same 21 knot top speed as the other standards. She did this on a turboelectric power plant, rated at 28,600 shaft horsepower, through four shafts. Nothing special here for contemporary American designs. With that out of the way, we can move to the surface history. The ship that would become USS California was laid down on October 25th, 1916, at the Mare Island Shipyard in California. This makes her the only Dreadnought-style battleship built on the West Coast, as well as the special case of a ship being built in her namesake state. While both of those facts are special, her construction itself was pretty average. The ship would be launched on November 20th, 1919, after Great War-related delays. As was common with wartime, building priorities shifted to smaller ships, and work was slowed down. Even so, California wasn't that far behind schedule. As for her commissioning, that came on August 10th, 1921. She was, as a result, one of the newest ships to escape the great scrapping of the Washington Naval Treaty. All of this being said, of course, her initial service was not the most exciting thing in the world. In common with most American ships of her day, California spent most of her time on routine duties. Port visits, training missions, and the various fleet problems. As such, I'll focus on the interesting parts of her interwar career. Luckily, that came relatively soon into it. On November 11th, 1924, she was used to help aviation technology. A naval aviator, one Lieutenant Dixie Kiefer, made the first night takeoff from a ship. He took his rickety biplane, a Vought U01, and launched from California's catapult. At a stationary mooring, of course. While by no means the most impressive of showings, this was a crucial moment in aviation history particularly naval aviation history. It pointed the way forward to the night aircraft carrier operations of the Second World War. As for the ship herself, California continued on her usual duties. She served as the flagship of the Pacific Fleet and the battle fleet that succeeded it for most of her career. With that came a certain amount of prestige, as well as pressure to perform for her crew. It did not, however, change her career much. Although, in 1925, she was used in an experiment alongside USS Oklahoma. Specifically, the two battleships were used to test bunks aboard ships to replace hammocks. While I would guess the sailors largely approved of this, it would be some time before the Navy, as a whole, made that switch. With those new bunks, California led the battle fleet on a goodwill cruise to Australia and New Zealand. This would be the furthest from home the ship sailed until she was blasting Japanese islands 20 years later. Since that is 20 years later, let's return to the interwar period. After returning from her trip down under, California and several other battleships received new catapults. You can see this on pictures from the time, with California carrying a turret-mounted catapult and one on her stern, such as this picture from her next notable event, a naval review on June 4, 1927, by President Calvin Coolidge. This took place off Hampton Roads, Virginia, one of the rare times California sailed in the Atlantic. Another Atlantic detour came with fleet problems 10 and 11 in 1930. Fleet Problem 10, from March 10th to March 15th, is mostly notable for USS Lexington, disabling her sister Saratoga and the older USS Langley. 
This was an early sign of how easily air power could shift a battle. It also saw ships shooting at friendly planes, which was an easy mistake to make at the time. Langley also had the unfortunate distinction of being shot at by cruisers, simulated or not. Still better off than Saratoga in that regard. Because Fleet Problem 11 saw California's sister, Tennessee, join West Virginia in shooting up Saratoga. That simulated fire was all well and good, except Saratoga was their carrier. California at least missed out on the friendly fire, as she performed well during the fleet problems. She just didn't do anything particularly notable, either. Not in March, with Fleet Problem 10, and not in April, with Fleet Problem 11. With those done, however, California sailed up to New York with the rest of the fleet for another naval review, this time by President Herbert Hoover. At the conclusion of that review, California returned to her stomping grounds in the Pacific, and went about her usual routine. Fleet problems 12 and 13 followed, but those saw little of note for California, as important as they were to the fleet at large. As such, the next notable event for California came in March 1933. In that month, she joined no less than 130 ships in welcoming USS Constitution on the California stop of her nationwide tour. Man, imagine the stories the ships could tell about that. After Constitution's visit on March 9th, however, California had one of its infamous earthquakes. On March 10th, 1933, the Long Beach earthquake struck. This was by no means as bad as the San Francisco quake, but it was still a severe incident. The Navy sent thousands of men ashore to help survivors, including some of California's crew. It wouldn't do for the flagship to ignore the suffering of her namesake state's people. After that, however, the remainder of the 1930s became rather routine and uneventful. California sailed up and down the West Coast on training duty. She would also venture out into the Pacific for the continuing fleet problems, although she would never really stand out from the pack in those exercises. Probably the most notable things came in 1934, when California visited Haiti after Fleet Problem 15 in May, following which California sailed up to New York for yet another naval review. This was the third president to do so in her career, with Franklin Roosevelt embarking on Indianapolis for the proceedings. Then it was back to the Pacific and training, until California got to be part of another experiment. This time, it was for something a bit more showy than swapping hammocks for bunks. Because, in 1939, the Navy began to look at shipborne radar sets. This was still a very new, very experimental technology. British use of radar in the Battle of Britain was yet to come. Shipborne sets would have to wait even longer to really get to shine. Nonetheless, in 1940, the Navy fit six ships with the experimental CXAM radar set. Four of them were installed on heavy cruisers. USS Pensacola, USS Northampton, USS Chester, and USS Chicago. One of the other two went to USS Yorktown as an aircraft carrier test. And the final set went to California to test it on a battleship. Of course, by this point in time, war clouds were gathering. The war in Europe was well underway, and the Japanese were getting more and more belligerent. As a result, after Fleet Problem 21, the Pacific Fleet was reassigned to Pearl Harbor. This was done on May 7, 1940. There it and California would remain until a sunny December morning that lives in infamy. On the morning of December 7, 1941, California was, alongside Nevada, special in being moored alone. She was, however, unfortunate in that the ship had been prepared for a material inspection. Watertight doors, portholes, external doors, and hatches 
were all open to aid in that inspection. What had been intended to make an inspection easier would end up almost spelling the end of USS California. That wouldn't have been immediately apparent, however, as the attack began. The initial action went well enough for California. In spite of only having two machine guns and two 5-inch guns ready for action, she fought back well. However, with only 400 rounds of 50 caliber ammunition, that ran out quickly. The same went for the 50 rounds of 5-inch ammo. Nonetheless, under the command of Lieutenant Commander Marion Little, the ship fought back. He ordered the ship secured for action, and the boilers fired up, while men set about unlocking the rest of the ship's ammunition. Her guns shot back at the Japanese, even as Zero strafed the ship. They weren't the most effective weapons on that day, but that doesn't diminish the bravery of her crew. However, the fatal blows came soon enough. At 8.05 a.m., two torpedoes slammed into California's port side. The first tore a hole in her side, 10 feet high and 24 feet long. This also deformed her first torpedo bulkhead and damaged the second one. As for the second torpedo, that did substantially more damage. It tore a 40-foot long hole beneath the armor belt. Even though California's interior torpedo bulkheads held up, the ship began to rapidly flood. The open portholes and watertight doors let water into the ship faster than it could be pumped out. Efforts to counter flood succeeded only in keeping California from capsizing. As the ship settled lower and lower, Japanese bombers continued to attack. Dive bombers repeatedly dove on the battleship, though their relatively light bombs did little damage compared to the torpedoes. Through it all, even as damage control efforts continued, California fired back. Her crew claimed to down two attackers during this, although that's difficult to verify. Unfortunately, at 8.45, a much larger bomb hit the ship. This tore through her deck before exploding inside. This further compounded her flooding issues in addition to starting severe fires. This fire would eventually force the evacuation of the ship, although not before multiple heroic actions. Her engineers got four of her boilers running, providing the power necessary to run the pumps, and four men would earn the Medal of Honor for their actions. Jackson Forrest, Herbert Jones, Thomas Reeves, and Robert Scott. That being said, no amount of heroism would save the ship. California settled into the mud until burying herself 16 feet into the bottom. 104 of her crew were killed, and a further 61 were wounded. As for the ship, California lay buried in the mud for some time. She was severely damaged, but not irreparably so. Compared to the beating West Virginia suffered, California was practically pristine. Okay, that may be exaggerating a bit, but you get my point. Salvage operations would commence almost immediately. Pumps were installed, and various bits were cut away and removed, up to and including her main battery guns, all in an effort to lighten the ship. This is also where her distinctive cage mass was cut away and pulled off the ship. While not as famous as Oklahoma's salvage, this was still an impressive feat of engineering. All the more so for the fact the ship was refloated by March 25th, 1942. That's remarkably fast, considering the damage she sustained. The pictures of the salvage speak to this effort, as do the interior pictures, like her birthing quarters seen here, or her admiral's quarters in this picture. Although I think the pictures of her empty turrets and the mud line are probably the most impressive. Nonetheless, the ship was out of the water in March of 1942. Her saga wasn't done, however. A vapor explosion occurred aboard the ship on April 5th. This blew off a patch on the ship and opened her up to the water again. It didn't sink her, though, as the hole was patched up and the water pumped out. 
By June 7, 1942, she was able to leave dry dock under her own power. Further repairs continued, in addition to putting her main battery guns back aboard. However, that would not last long. On October 10th, the battered battleship set off for the west coast. She would arrive by October 20th, at which point California went in for a complete rebuild. While the ship was largely intact as it was, there was no reason not to completely rebuild her. She was already in need of refurbishing, so the Navy might as well go the whole nine yards as it were. This was akin to the other standard rebuilds, with California coming out looking like West Virginia. Her displacement rose to 41,000 tons at full loading. A lot of this came from the new superstructure that changed her entire silhouette, as well as the new weaponry stuffed aboard. Her old casements were gone, replaced by eight twin 5-inch 38 caliber gun mounts, four on either side of the ship. Those were joined, at least at first, by 11 quadruple and six twin 40mm Bofors mounts, for 56 barrels in all, as well as 43 single 20mm cannon mounts. This would, of course, grow over the course of the war. For the moment, however, California set sail to rejoin the fleet on May 31st, 1944. By June 10th, she was back with the fleet, now flying the flag of Rear Admiral Jesse Allendorf. Of course, by this point, the war was largely over. Only a little over a year remained. California would spend that year, as most of the other standards did, hating Japanese-held islands out of existence, or doing a lot of shore bombardment, if you prefer. Her first action came in the invasion of the Marianas on June 14, 1944. This should have been a fairly routine affair, but California had the bad luck to be hit by an enemy shell while bombarding Saipan. This punched through the battleship at 9.10 a.m. on June 14th, killing one man and wounding a few others. It also knocked out her air search radar and started a fire. American damage control being what it is, the fire was quickly brought under control. California continued bombarding the island, over the course of the operation, including a couple notable moments. First, on June 15th, she blasted a formation of Japanese tanks. Then, on June 18th, her 40mm guns managed to hit a larger gun mount, on board California as they shot one of her 5-inch mounts. Well, accidents happen, I suppose. In any case, over the course of the action, California absolutely plastered Saipan. At one point, she fired 1,400 rounds of 5-inch ammunition onto the island. That's an average of a shell per square yard. All of that firing would, in addition to the earlier damage, require a short refit for the ship. She set off for Iniwatok on June 23, 1944, and would remain there until July 16th. By July 20th, she was back in action, this time supporting the landings on Guam. And then, starting on the 23rd, California's guns shifted to Tinian. She would remain off those two islands until August 9th, when the battleship set off to restock and refuel once more. Not the most exciting of times, but then that's typical of this part of the war. The Leathernecks ashore almost certainly appreciated California's big guns. What California's crew would not have appreciated, however, was what came on August 23, 1944. On that night, Tennessee's steering jammed, and her stern crashed into California's port bow. This tore a hole in the ship ahead of her number one turret, and caused some pretty bad damage. That it was sister ships colliding like this just makes it worse. Seven men were killed aboard California, although Tennessee definitely suffered more damage here. Even so, California would have to enter a floating dry dock for repairs that lasted until September 10th. She would, as a result, miss the invasion of Peleliu. 
Instead, her next action would come in the invasion of the Philippines. This began about the same as the Marianas campaign, with more shore bombardment. However, the Japanese Navy would throw itself at the American fleet for one last decisive battle. On the night of October 24, 1944, California joined other old standards for the Battle of Surigao Strait. This was, perhaps, one of the most lopsided engagements in naval history. The Japanese formation, formed around the old battleships Fuso and Yamashiro, was heavily outmatched. Their escort, the cruiser Mogami and four destroyers, were no match for the swarm of PT boats and destroyers the Americans threw at them. As they sailed down Surigao Strait, the Japanese lost Fuso to torpedo attack. Yamashiro was damaged and the destroyer force was gutted, with only Shigure surviving the battle. Even if they had survived the torpedoes, it wouldn't have mattered. Yamashiro, now more or less alone, sailed right into six of these standards. California, Maryland, Mississippi, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, and West Virginia. All of these ships, other than Mississippi, had been at Pearl Harbor. This was their payback, and poor Yamashiro suffered for it. California, after nearly colliding with her sister ship for a second time, fired 63 shells from her main battery. With the southern force obliterated, the American battleships turned north. Frantic calls for help had arrived from the Taffies, and the old standards set off to help. They would, naturally, not arrive in time. Kurita and the best of Japan's battleships had been driven off by a handful of small ships and brave airmen. As such, California returned to shore bombardment. Until, that is, she suffered her final damage of the war. On January 6, 1945, she was hit by a kamikaze that slammed into California's side. This impacted relatively minor damage, aside from a fire. More damage was arguably done by a 5-inch shell fired from another ship, that wrecked one of the battleship's 5-inch mounts. Damage aside, California remained on station and continued to bombard the Japanese. In spite of losing 44 men, with another 155 injured. Dedication on the part of her crew, for sure. That said, by the end of January, the aging battleship set off for the west coast. She needed permanent repairs to her damage, and a general overhaul on top of that. California arrived on the West Coast in February of 1945, and she would remain there until May. By that point, the war was basically over, at least as far as naval actions were concerned. California sailed across the Pacific, arriving off Okinawa on June 15, 1945. There was very little for her to do by this point, other than shoot up the island. This she did for the rest of June and July, with various breaks to patrol or resupply. No more kamikazes hit the ship, either. In fact, California wouldn't even be in action when the war ended. She was in the Philippines on a routine refit. With the war well and truly over, all that was left for California to do was support the occupation of Japan in late September of 1945, as well as various troop transport duties, returning fighting men home. In her case, she transported South African soldiers home, before sailing across the Atlantic, arriving in Philadelphia on December 7, 1945. There the ship would remain, placed in reserve on August 7, 1946. She was then decommissioned on February 14, 1947. As one of the more modern and relatively capable standards, USS California remained in the reserve fleet inventory until March 1, 1959. By that point, she was well and truly obsolete, even for shore bombardment. USS California, a veteran of Pearl Harbor, was sold for scrap on July 10, 1959. Her bell, at least, would be preserved 
and put on display in Sacramento, California. Thank you for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoy the content. And I'll see you in the next one.